The next two speakers, uh, everyone at MAPS knows, everyone at MAPS respects, um, Rick and uh, Richard and, and Jessica. Uh, Richard, hello, how are you? You are muted. Hello, Jessica. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. All right, you two. It's your floor. So we were asked today to do um, a presentation on um, our recruiting efforts and kind of how we are how we operate and how and how we recommend um, some of the processes go internally. So, and welcome. Um, I hope that we would provide useful information uh, for you today. My name is Richard Serby. I am the founder and the CEO. I'm an incompetent CFO, <laughs> and um, I'm also a chief custodian. So we are a small business. Uh, my daughter Jessica and I and a niece Chelsea and Chelsea is enjoying herself um, in Breckenridge right now so uh, we're uh, uh, it's just Jessica and myself for today and Jessica would you like to go ahead and uh, start so what we're going to talk about today just in our toolbox um, that we will explain is just when you're approaching a recruiting project, um, any open position, whether it is a senior level or all the way down to a, a technician level role, um, you're going to want to make a plan, gather supplies, make the cut, verify a fit, and then we'll of course talk about the cost of doing business and the salary negotiation phase. So what we mean when we our um, starting a recruiting project and making a plan. Um, I think this is always the most important tool in anybody's toolbox, whether it is a recruiting, a recruiting effort or any other kind of project, is to really have an, a definite plan going forward. In a recruiting effort, obviously that may entail a job description, definitely. Um, but really defining the role outside of just the skills needed, but really the true function of the position, um, what those daily work activities are going to entail in terms of um, physical and, and uh, mental work activities needed, any hard skills needed, the soft skills, uh, personality traits, um, things that are very important to um, different management, sales, um, those kinds of roles. And then of course, defining the slated salary for the given role. And then thirdly, really talking about what would motivate somebody to take this position? What would motivate somebody to seek out this position? What position may they be in now? Is this a lateral move or is this something that, you know, hey, we, we would really like somebody with XYZ experience who's ready to step into this role. So um, almost your sales pitch on why would somebody wanna take this position? Job description is really important uh, because <clears throat> it is the way in which we try to calibrate our thinking to your thinking um, and um, make sure that we understand clearly what the skill requirements are, the experience requirements, and so forth. And I've been saying this for 32 years when we started 32 years ago, and that is if uh, you do not give me a target, I guarantee I won't hit it. So that job description is actually how we develop our target. So when we start a recruiting effort here, we're always kind of looking at a funnel approach, um, kind of gathering everybody who may be interested and then whittling it down to um, the people that we are interested in talking with and who are um, the best fit for any particular position. So um, in order to do that, we rely on um, heavily on our company website and an internal database, which many of you probably hold as well. Um, and those, and we, are, we make sure that those types of positions um, or our posted positions are aggregated out into different uh, job boards automatically. Um, we utilize LinkedIn, we utilize other geospatial job boards. Um, and then uh, what we strongly recommend in terms of a toolbox is, is personal networking. Make sure you're posting um, your positions on your company's social media page when it makes sense to do so. Um, asking your employees to post uh, the position on their 
professional networking pages such as LinkedIn. Um, that is proven to increase visibility by, by about 80%. So that, that is something to really um, keep in mind. And then um, precision sourcing, of course, anybody who has a um, particular candidate uh, referral to your HR department, identifying some competitors. We do that here a lot. Um, we will talk to you anytime you call us for a search. We're going to be talking with you about, okay, where do these people likely work? Um, somebody like that. And so those are our lists to keep in mind. Um, and then, of course, um, I call it profile hunting, but whether that's on uh, something like LinkedIn or it's on the internet, um, on, on different company pages, just really doing some precision sourcing on this is the type of person we really want to find. And I uh, would like to focus on what you can be doing internally <clears throat> to help yourself with regard to sourcing good candidates. And that is to talk to your staff. Um, ask your staff for ideas with regard to uh, people that they know, uh, people that they're acquainted with, people that they perhaps went to school with, um, and that they believe uh, would be a good fit within the organization. Some um, firms, some companies, have formalized this approach by awarding a cash um, bonus for um, having provided a person who became a candidate for a position who was hired for that position and they're turning out to be uh, a really a good choice of, of new employee. And so that would encourage when, they, uh, when that employee um, makes others in the company know uh, that they have been rewarded for having um, introduced a friend to the company, um, that will get other employees thinking about who do they know and who are they connected with. And uh, that can become a very important tool uh, to uh, your hiring uh, methods. So once we've generated and gathered up all of our tools, um, we are going to start to whittle away at, um, at that candidate pool. Um, one of the, I think, most important tools that we use here, and I'm sure many of you or your HR department uses, is a successful phone screen. And this is different than an interview process. This is something that is much more informal. Many times I don't even schedule this. This is just something I may call somebody that's in the car with three kids, and I'm just asking them some, some basic questions about the position, um, not expecting any kind of real uh, formal conversation at this point. Um, but many times when, when companies approach this, they're inclined to kind of begin the conversation with asking the candidate to tell them why they're a good fit. Um, and we challenge you all to turn that process around a little bit. Uh, the most successful uh, phone screens that I've had start with me explaining to the candidate exactly what the ideal candidate looks like and what our company is looking for, our client. Um, and that kind of allows two things to happen. One is the candidate is able to self-screen. They may say, you know what, I didn't realize you needed so much programming background in this position. I'm not sure I'm a good fit. Um, I know somebody that I may be able to get, put you in touch with, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person. Um, or, you know, I didn't know so much travel was going to be involved or, or whatever the, um, the position is going to entail. This is a really quick way to whittle away at the at the major block of, of candidates sometimes that we're looking at, um, even when they appear on a resume to be a fairly good fit. Um, on the other, on the flip side, it also allows the right candidate to really emphasize and describe to me how they fit the company's needs, how exactly, you know, maybe they didn't um, stress on their resume all of their, um, you know, commercial connections or utility connections when we're looking at a salesperson or something like that. And they can really emphasize to me in that call exactly how they fit the role we're describing. And, um, and in this call, we typically are also talking about things like job location, amount of travel, salary, those kinds of basic things that we need to know in order to see if this is going to be um, a, good, a good time spent. The uh, other value of a telephone uh, screening uh, process is that you're able to get a handle on their telephone 
communication skills. Does their personality come through the telephone? It almost is as if they are sitting in front of you because they're so uh, skilled at using the telephone as a communication tool. And of course, that's very important when we're talking about salespeople. Uh, very important when we're talking about project managers who have to have a frequent client interface. And oftentimes that's by telephone. And uh, so it is a useful, uh, a useful tool to get an idea of the quality of communicator that we have in this particular candidate and how important is that to the skill mix that we're dealing with. Then we would move, of course, on to the interview process, which um, in our case, we, we would toss it back to our clients to, um, to do this portion. Um, but what we're always stressing and when our clients come to us with questions about what is important in the interview process, it's really, again, preparation and collaboration with any team members you're gonna have um, on an interview team. And make sure that you're prepared with questions that will help you decide if the candidate's a good fit. Sometimes we use the, these sort of general questions that we're all, um, that are for every single position, which are sometimes are fine, but you really want to hone in on what is really the most important thing in this particular role and how can we um, make sure that that is uncovered during an interview process. Yeah, Collaborate with the other interviewers to make sure that questions are not being repetitive, of course. And then we always encourage um, the interview process to be con as conversational as possible, not as many, you know, not too many yes or no questions, that kind of thing, and to put everyone at ease and to allow um, all of the information to become visible to the, the interview team. One of the uh, realities of especially the face-to-face -face interview is oftentimes the most anxious person in the room is the person conducting the interview, <laughs> especially if this is a, a new manager, someone who has just been promoted into the position and is now also placed in the position of interviewing uh, for additional staff. Uh, this can be true of those who are very experienced but not comfortable with uh, personal interviews. So I would encourage um, everyone to find a, a plan, a program, um, a, some kind of a tutorial uh, with regard to training people how to be a good interviewer. <clears throat> a lot of that has to do with organizing uh, the appropriate questions. Try to stay away from yes and no questions. Try to make them open-ended. Uh, the exception of that, of course, would be for a technical question where you are listening for a, for a precise response. Um, but other than that, um, allow those questions to be open-ended so it can be more conversational. But see, uh, find a way to, find, uh, to provide training, especially for young leading lead technicians, uh, young project managers those who would be participating in interviews so that they begin to develop a level of comfort with the interview process. And then as you're moving closer to the offer stage, um, just verifying that this is the correct fit for you. Um, of course, there's a lot of different tools that people utilize. We always recommend second or third interviews, even if that's just in the form of a Zoom call or another telephone conversation, if there's any doubt or there's other things that come to mind that you want to discuss. Um, technical testing for when that's appropriate. Reference checks, which um, are hit and miss these days a little bit in terms of what people are able to provide or are willing to provide. Um, but they still, I think, are very important to do. Um, personality profiles, some, some of our clients utilize that either internally or have asked us to, to facilitate something like that, um, which in some positions I think um, can be very useful in making sure that this is gonna be a fit for your organization. And then any background checks or drug testing that is um, important to your contracts or, or company to do that. The, uh 
we have in, uh, with some employers, we have had technical testing as a part of the application process. So they haven't even been um, interviewed other than by telephone. But as a part of the application process, they're provided with a test that will give some indication of the level of technical skill uh, that is required for the position. And so that is often come, comes through our office, but it can just as easily come from your HR folks um, to provide that uh, vehicle as a part of the resume, as a part of any other background information that you need to know. If there are some specific technical skills that must be um, uh, obtained, uh, then um, providing a technical test as a part of the application has, is frequently done. The personality profile, I'm a career counselor by training and, and the personality profile is something that can be a useful tool if you are trying to determine whether or not a person um, is going to fit the culture of the organization um, and make sure that there would seem to be a good fit with regard to the personality profile and the culture, the personality of your organization. So these things can be useful tools um, and um, we encourage that, uh, that you use those. So salary negotiations um, are probably one of the topics that we get the most questions on from clients and from um, attendees at different conferences and such. Um, and they can be tricky, especially if you've not defined the expectations along the way. Um, as I mentioned, we kind of, we like to do that in the first conversation. Um, and that is um, not to show anybody's hand, you know, or, or anything like that. It's just to make sure that this is, you know, a viable fit. People work to make a living and people expect <laughs> to be doing so. So um, I don't think that's any surprise. Um, and even here in Colorado, we're seeing more and more discussions on this um, as equal pay for equal work kind of issues are, are nationally discussed. Um, there is a slated um, law right now that's up for approval that Colorado employers would have to include um, compensation ranges and available benefits in job postings, even for positions that are outside of the state. So, but if they're a Colorado based firm, they will have to disclose that right in the job description. Um, and that's a good, you know, that's a, it has pros and cons to it, of course, um, depending on, on your perspective, but always, I think it will help find the right fit for you. Um, and oftentimes when we're having, a, sometimes we put out a position, we can't get anybody to apply, and that's other times we put out a position and everyone under the sun applies. And so um, one of the ways that I've used in the past to make sure I'm targeting the right level of person and everything is that salary, is that salary, putting it out there. Um, particularly I find with mid-level positions, um, it's sometimes hard to attract that mid-level person. It's almost always these senior level um, resumes coming through for different reasons, I don't know. So, so it's one way also to really define that expectation up front to consider posting that um, kind of thing. And also, you know, as you are entering into formal salary negotiations to make sure that you're doing verbal offers and um, avoid having the formal offer go back and forth too many times. The verbal offer is a very important part of this because uh, as in a game of tennis, um, if that ball goes back and forth too often, someone's going to get tired of the game and walk away. I have had uh, personal um, experience with a six-figure uh, position um, go fall apart over $500. So uh, when that goes back and forth too many times, uh, that is, uh, uh, that's not a good thing in terms of just handling this efficiently. That is where a recruiter can come in uh, to, to be pretty important, to handle that verbal part first, get questions answered uh, before proceeding with a formal offer. Yeah, people tend to be much more candid. Um, it's hard to be candid when, when you're in the negotiation right with the hiring manager, so. Okay, um, <laughs> these tools can be expensive. Um, I looked at the numbers for 2019 for 
our small firm and we spent $150,000 just on things related to technology, our website, LinkedIn, SEO services, uh, applicant tracking, uh, indeed, and even mailing. Uh, if you are a field surveyor, you are more likely to get a letter from us uh, than a phone call uh, because you're not available for a phone call. And um, you don't spend a lot of time on the internet. So I just uh, sent letters to 600 of my favorite surveyors in a, in a state uh, to make sure that they knew that we had a position for which they were qualified. And I hope that that will make my phone ring. So um, it can be expensive. Now, we just had CFOs uh, on a panel. Uh, they may have scratched their head and said, well, we spent that last week. Um, so <laughs> uh, as you know, technology is expensive and the technology that you folks deal with uh, day in and day out is especially expensive. But we wanna make sure that when we make a phone call that they know who we are and they know the name of GeoSearch. And I love it when I get a response that, you, uh, you remember me, uh, my name is Jim Smith and you placed me in a position in 1996 and I'm still there. And I love hearing that. And um, so it's a, uh, it's a way for us making sure that people know who we are and what we do is really important to our establishing a, a communication and effective communication. With, uh, with our candidates. And for the record, I did not place anybody in 1996. <laughs> well, you all are hired. <laughs> okay, Hopefully like that. that for any questions you might have. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, you're talking about a personality profile test. Do you have a favorite one that you recommend that people use? Well, um, I have used uh, interest testing, online interest testing, um, especially when I'm working with young people. Um, we have been introduced to some more sophisticated sort of psychometric uh, testing tools uh, that are available. Um, I don't think I have any favorites. Um, when I'm doing career coaching and I'm doing um, counseling in, in that realm. I'm typically looking at uh, autobiographies are very useful. Um, uh, tell me the story of your life as far back as you can remember. Though That gives me a sense of what's important to this person and how that fits uh, an organization. What kind of an organization would they be comfortable in? Uh, would they thrive in? Um, so but access to those tools is uh, at your fingertips and uh, we can introduce you to some of those as well that we've been discovering uh, recently. The ones that I think are, are kind of trending and also I probably are uh, pretty effective in, in putting somebody in the right, um, I guess, slot um, in, your, in your personality as a company are those that compare you to the candidate. So you may have, for instance, if you're hiring an executive or, or a high level business development manager or something like that, that's gonna be working really closely with the executive team to put profile test the whole team. And then you don't, you're not trying to clone yourself, you're trying to see how this person can complement um, your team and make sure that you're not getting, you know, you're, that you're not putting yourself into um, possible situations where there's gonna be a lot of, um, headbutting or anything. <laughs> but, you know, those I think are, are probably, when you're talking about strategic hire, um, probably something that could be really useful. And it's not, you know, it's not a right or wrong test. It is just a, you know, how does this, how do you fit into the, the puzzle of our company? Great. So what's, what's the easiest position to fill and the hardest position to fill right now? Well, the, um, on the technical side, um, right now for us, it's, it's uh, professional land surveyors. That's the most difficult right now. I think you've been saying that for two years. I have been saying that for at least two years. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I'll keep saying it. <laughs> uh, and I hope that we, as a as a important part of this uh, profession that we're in, I hope that the training programs come back. I hope that we're smart about how we are introducing the profession to high school students, um, getting them some experience uh, in and at least observing or participating in the field, internships and so forth, to uh, to help guide young people into the profession that would be very happy in the profession if they knew anything about it. And, uh, and that's a, an important thing. We always run into a situation where we're asked to find someone with five years ex of experience in a technology that's five minutes old. So we <laughs> run into that occasionally that something's brand new, a brand new important tool and uh, no one has had uh, much experience with it yet. Uh, the, 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 the easier ones uh, tend to be the uh, entry to mid-level technical. Um, a lot of, you know, we're very heavily involved with a lot of GIS uh, type of uh, recruitment all the time. Um, and uh, the more difficult ones are the ones that get into a pretty sophisticated uh, um, programming, whether that is for specifically for utilities or specifically for transportation, whatever that might be, applications development or software development. Uh, those are difficult positions to, to fill. Okay. Uh, we did have a question come up. What is your forecast of the job market in the next year? And are you seeing a lot of open positions and searches? Well, one of the um, factors is, and, and, and all of us experienced all of this at the same time, typically during early to mid-March uh, this past year. And uh, we took a hit uh, for sure, and we have since made up for that. But what I would uh, predict is that the, um, this need to look at remote uh, remotely located uh, candidates who would work from a remote home office uh, situation will continue for this next year. Uh, we're not done with this virus yet. Um, and that uh, it has forced all of us to take a, a, a look at how it is we do business uh, without having to be there in person. So I think it will affect, uh, will continue to have an impact on travel it will have an impact on being able to meet with people personally. Um, and I don't think, I, I believe that our economy is resilient. And I like what the CFOs had to say about it really doesn't matter who's, going, who's elected to office. Infrastructure is going to be at the front of the line, I believe in the priorities for whoever is next in office and for the which, whatever kind of uh, team of people that we have at the highest levels, that infrastructure has been become an important conversation and an important priority. So I hope that that's true because that will literally put millions of people back to work in good paying jobs. One of the things I've noticed in that regard, um, and I've been asked a couple times by um, employers and candidates about, you know, has, has this just opened up all these people to, you know, looking for jobs, suddenly everyone's desperate for a job, maybe we can pay them less, you know, these kinds of things. That has not happened. Um, we are seeing that we are still in a very competitive um, market for good talent. Um, in fact, I would you know, I, and I loved how the, uh, the CFO panel addressed um, how do we keep our employees engaged? How do we create that culture so that they're still very committed? Because I think this, this uh, remote work environment that we're heading into basically allows people to compete for talent nationally now. They don't have to have an office next, you know, in your town to then be recruiting out of your employee pool. So it is, it is going to provide or, you know, kind of sets the groundwork that for talent, it is going to be a little bit more competitive, especially for, you know, very niche or, or um, 
talent that we're all competing for. So it's just something to keep in mind um, regarding your company culture. And I know it's a challenge and I'm glad you're all focusing on it because I think I think that is going to be something that is going to change because of this remote work environment. There was a question about whether we prefer degrees over certifications. And the answer is yes and yes. Um, the, <laughs> sort of the, uh, the beginning level for most any position that you're going to be qualified for as a young person going into the, the field would be at least an associate's level degree um, and some uh, good lab experience. The bachelor's degree is still the standard. Uh, but even those who possess a master's degree and they need to upgrade their skills, uh, certifications are available in almost all of the technologies that we work with within the uh, profession. And it is uh, why, very wise to keep your skills sharpened, even if you are promoted into a position where you don't have to use those tools every day. You still have to understand them. And there is no such thing as uh, being a project manager uh, without having the knowledge of current technical skills to assist your team. So uh, the degrees are important, but uh, once that degree is a week and a half old, uh, your, technology, uh, your technology profile, your skills in understanding and being able to use and help others understand the technology uh, become important. All right, one final question. Yes. Going back to personality types, are there any least des desirable personality types in the geospatial world? Um, or does everyone have a place? I think, I think most everyone has a place. Uh, I've met one or two who I'm surprised they have. Maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think we all have a place and uh, regardless of our personality type um, and that goes for the that that person who is an introvert and prefers to work alone and loves the workstation um, or if that person is an extrovert and enjoys communicating with people enjoys being on a team uh, enjoys being a part of the conversations that are that are being had about the business and about projects. Um, so I think you know it's uh, uh, it's unlike our small business where you really have to spread rumors about yourself and talk behind your own back. You know that's <laughs> the way we work. Um, it's a uh, I think that there's a place for everyone, and if they if that is a good fit. Um, for uh, any organization, if they understand the culture of their organization and begin to have the, a way to understand the personalities that will fit within the organization best, um, that, that goes a long way in terms of, of uh, selection. And typically there are a few categories that are a little bit hardwired in us. We all have um, personality traits that probably aren't going to change it much at all. But then there's more categories, you know, probably twice as many um, that would, that are, you know, they're just room for growth. We can all grow in different areas and, um, you know, doesn't mean that, it just means that the, those are areas that we're going to have to focus and, and those aren't, um, you know, that doesn't mean that they'll never come to that, uh, you know, be able to improve those skills. All right. Well, I thank both of you very much. Richard, Jesse, always good to hear from you. Thank you. We want thank to thank you. search for their continued support of MAPS. And Jessica, we still have some positions open that you need to work on. All right. We're going for it. <laughs> thank you both. I appreciate thank it very you. much. Thanks. Thanks.